talk about those evil ramp lights off the ramp freeway. Lights. See, that's another genius invention that they created. He's really good at playing a grump on the radio. Hey, we need to back up traffic down the freeway ramp all the way into the surface streets. And he does make a good point. After a long day, all you want to do is get home. You wait for several stoplights just to get to the freeway. And then on the on-ramp, there's another stoplight. Seemingly for no reason. Traffic engineers claim that by slowing you down just a little bit here on the ramp, it'll speed you up quite a bit on the freeway over there. It goes much better, much smoother, and we move more cars. Is the wait really worth it? So are traffic engineers just putting in another traffic signal for fun? Well, no, I mean, traffic signals cost a lot of money, and each one they install slightly elevates the crash risk that somebody might not be paying attention and will slam into the car. No, this traffic signal does something really neat, and to find out how it works, I decided to ask somebody. We try to move people as fast as we can without breaking the, the flow of traffic on the main line. Mohammed Bendelholm uses ramp meters to smooth out traffic flow on some of California's freeways. At the red light on the city street below the freeway on ramp, our cars stack up. You and I and Hector and Phil and Karen, who's actually really nice, get a green light and turn left together. Our group of cars is called a platoon. We race up onto the freeway as a big bunch, and when the freeway is busy, our multi-car intrusion messes up the flow of traffic on the freeway. A ramp meter makes each one of us take turns, and when we enter the freeway one car at a time, the freeway flow is less likely to get messed up. But to really dig deep into why ramp meters are really cool, you need to go to traffic school. Time for Traffic Flow Fundamentals 101. Don't worry, it's not as scary as it sounds. This free-flowing road has no stoplights or stop signs. Let's imagine each car spaces themselves one mile apart from the next car. That's density. Take a frozen snapshot of a moving freeway and look at how crowded each lane is at that exact moment. And then there's speed, which you know very well. Don't have to explain that one. When we multiply density with speed, miles cancels out and we're left with a flow rate, 60 cars per hour. More cars on the road and that density number goes up. A bigger density number here means a bigger flow rate there. The freeway can move more cars, and flow rate is the name of the game. Keep that number higher than the demand for the freeway, and you'll never see another traffic jam again. Now take note how the less crowded freeway is actually moving more cars than the crowded one. Now if you're an electrical engineer, you must be thinking about this equation. Amps times volts equals watts and say, okay, well, amps are kind of like the density of the cars on the road, and they have a limit. Volts are like the speed limit, which, you know, with enough horsepower, is unlimited. Uh, hold up. So if you want to move twice as many cars on a totally full road, well, all you need to do is just drive twice as fast, right? Traffic solved. Ohm's law doesn't really work in traffic engineering, and instinctively you do know why. It's because as we drive faster, we tend to spread out more. It's the old two-second following rule from driver's ed. Being glued to somebody's bumper is fine when you're going 10 miles an hour like I am right now. But as I speed up to 60 miles an hour, I'm going to need hundreds of feet to be able to travel safely. See, electrons don't do that. They're little tailgaters. They stay right on each other's bumper no matter how many volts get thrown at them. So getting more flow rate means you can't just up density or up speed because those two sort of cancel each other out some. It's about finding a sweet spot for both. And engineers graph all of this with speed, faster goes up, against density, more crowded to the right. And it kind of makes sense. Can you drive 70 miles per hour on a nearly empty freeway? Sure! But how about driving 70 miles an hour on a kind of full freeway? 
well, yeah, there's still cushion for everyone to cruise along and to merge in and to change lanes. But what about a freeway which is tight? Barely enough room for your car plus the two seconds of following distance you need. Well, that's when freeway flow risks falling off a traffic cliff. Ouch. Okay, finally. So here's where this all ties into ramp meters and a little bit into lakes. If you have a freeway that's flowing, but traffic is heavy, it's really dense, a shock can throw that freeway over the traffic cliff too early. You might be able to squeeze another 10 or 20% potential out of a freeway, but out in the wild, shocks rob us of a freeway's full potential. We need to find a way to get rid of them. It could be something as simple as a broken down car on the right shoulder, or it could be somebody making a simple lane change, or it could be traffic merging in as a big platoon. Hint, hint. <laughs> the cars on the freeway will start to break because these cars are trying to merge in. They start breaking, it's like a ripple effect. Think of it almost like an accordion. When the instrument's wide open, there's room for the bellows to move back and forth. But when the instrument's nearly closed, it's really hard to play. When I'm driving down a low density freeway, there's room for me to break and not slow down the car behind me. But on a high density freeway, Everybody cascades in a sea of brake lights. And those big platoons of entering cars are one of the biggest culprits. If you can break the platoons up into little pieces. It's not as splashy when you do it that way. I wish I could, uh, I wish I knew how to skip stones. That would really uh, drive the point home. We break that platoon and make it go like one car at a time so they can merge into the flow of the uh, main nine lanes of the freeway. And it works like magic. Compare these two rush hour simulations, which a fan of the show cooked up for me in some professional modeling software. The line at the meter looks insane. But watch very quickly how much better the freeway moves because of it. Even with that extra weight at the meter, your overall travel time will be significantly shorter. We use the congestion on the mainline lanes of the freeway to trigger the ramp meter cycling. All our ramp meters operate in the traffic responsive mode 24 seven. So here in California, the ramp meters kick on at about 1600 cars per hour. That's about two thirds before it hits the maximum. And the computers can kick on all by themselves. You don't have to have an engineer come out and manually switch it on and off they don't even have to switch it on and off at a control center. The computer does all the thinking. The congestion on the mainline lane dictates when to start meeting. And it can turn on any time of day, 24 seven. So if you have the uh, Lakers losing to the Jazz in double overtime. The Jazz defeat the Los Angeles Lakers 63 to 18. At two o'clock in the morning and Staples Center is just dumping car after car after car onto the 110 freeway, those ramp meters can kick on even in the middle of the night. The same thing happens during morning and afternoon rush hour. They have a flashing beacon at the top that flashes when the meters are cycling. Because normally a freeway ramp is free flowing, you don't stop. And so a warning sign gets a driver's attention thinking, oh yeah, I gotta pay attention. There's a, a signal down there I've gotta stop for. So how do engineers safely switch a freeway on ramp from free flowing to metered? It starts on a green ball usually like three to five seconds. Then it goes to yellow and then it goes to red. Each green light allows one car to enter the freeway at a time. And then after that, it just goes from green to red, green to red, red, green, right? And then it, it goes from one lane to the other. Breaking up splashy platoons into little pebbles. The release rate is how often the meter lets a car through. When the density of traffic and the volume of traffic reaches a certain threshold, the controller looks at those uh, values and changes the rate automatically without our intervention. And as easily as the ramp meters switch on, they can also just as easily switch off when they're no longer needed which I learned the hard way. That is twice now. Everything was perfect, ready to film, and the meter turned off right as I was ready to record. Each time there is a project we put in the ramp metering system, we have to trench for conduits. They buried a loop of wire, a loop detector, can sense cars driving over it, at the top of the ramp. That lets the computer know how many cars to expect, how many are coming down to the light. 
there's another loop of wire right at the light. It reminds the computer, hey, there's somebody there who really wants to actually get on the freeway. And there's another loop of wire just beyond the meter to let the computer know that somebody really did go when the light turned green. And the creme de la creme, there's a whole bunch of loop detectors down on the freeway. That lets the computer know the current conditions, how crowded the freeway is. Still, no matter how well a ramp meter is configured, freeways do eventually fill up. We pass maximum density and everybody breaks to a stop. Well, sometimes you get to the freeway and you are in a parking lot, you know. And if that's the case, you may be wondering, well, if it's all an exercise in futility, why are we metering in the first place? It doesn't look like it's working, but it's actually making the rush hour slightly shorter. So let's go back to this graph. I'm going to redraw it a little differently. Replace speed with flow rate, which again is speed times density. How many cars the freeway is moving, and it shifts the graph to look like this. The density starts with just a few cars per mile, so even though they're flying along at full speed, the flow is low because there just aren't very many cars. On the other end, we have tons of cars, bumpers literally touching bumpers, but the flow rate is also low because those cars are traveling slowly or stopped. What we want is the peak, and we want it to be as high as possible, dense and fast. When a shock comes early, the flow peaks early, and the peak is far too low. Meters kicking on pushes the curve back up much more quickly than if we just let traffic take its natural course. Now I'm really going to mess with the graph and move density to the y-axis on the left and put time on the x-axis on the bottom. 7 a.m. on the left, 9 a.m. on the right. This dotted line is jam density. That's where the freeway clogs up because there's too many cars. In the wild, this is what the graph would look like. These big clumps are traffic jams, morning crowding. Meters shorten those jams. They start later, they clear sooner. And those little tiny slivers on each side mean more time for good flow. And good flow moves more cars. A ramp meter lets engineers be good stewards of tax dollars and really stretch the capacity we have, make sure we get every dollar's worth of freeway we already have, and that can help us delay or potentially cancel widening projects. So about 20 years ago, Minneapolis decided to try switching off all 400 of their ramp meters just for two months to see what difference the meters really made. It's a fun story, and it's one I'll be covering in an upcoming video. I'm assuming it's the people that want us to meet or more or the people that are on the main line driving by the ramps where people are coming on. So keep an eye out on the description for when that video comes out. So do ramp meters work? Yes. Minneapolis saw their freeways lose 10% of capacity with the meters turned off. Travel time took 20% longer, and sideswipe crashes doubled so they turned the meters back on. And that emboldened other cities to roll out their own meters. Okay, this thing recording. So check this out. This is a ramp meter on a freeway. Putting a meter on a ramp between two freeways is a little bit tricky because you definitely do not want cars backing up onto the 405 freeway. But it isn't much of a problem here. There's this long, continuous freeway connector ramp, probably over half a mile long. And of course, it's 2020, and I drove all the way out here, and the meter's turned off. But <laughs> you've seen it, and that's where it would be turned on if it was turned on. Who would ever thought I'd be complaining about there being not enough traffic in LA, right? Your in-laws, your mother-in-law is moving in with you. And they need a place to stay in your house, but you live in a little tiny house. It's barely big enough for you. So what you do is decide to spend $90,000 adding a guest bedroom to your house. It works, it's nice, it's preferable, but it costs a lot of money. A ramp meter is more like making your kids share a bedroom. They're not gonna like it. But it lets you stretch your money just a little bit further and postpone that big home renovation. A big thank you to Mohammed Bendelholm at the California Department of Transportation, District 8. Thank you for your generous contribution on Twitter, on Patreon, not Twitter. <laughs> Nobody donates on Twitter. I think I'm just gonna leave that in there.